Welcome to Text Readings with Greg Stafford, where we progressively work our way through the ancient biblical records and related texts and histories. Specifically, our interest is in the Bible and in the God of the Bible, the one God of the Bible who in the New Testament is called the Father and referred to by name specifically in the Old Testament and by reference through people like Jesus as Jah, Jahuwah, Jaho, the three forms of the divine name that are the best forms representative of the biblical God. The book we're going to be reviewing today is one I've only translated in small part, whereas other texts like Genesis, we started out from the beginning and considered a lot of the historical and textual material. With Deuteronomy, I've only done a couple of texts, and they're not at the very beginning. So I'm going to review the text I've translated, one today, and then the other in another text reading, either tomorrow or in a few days. And then the next time I come around, jaw willing, through to the book of Deuteronomy, I will have translated more at the earlier part. And we'll do it and discuss the historical textual material, like I did with Genesis and like we'll do with other books where I've translated more of the material. So let's get right to our reading and talk about what it has to say. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we're just going to read one verse, verse 11. It's a very important verse, and it's one that comes in the context of leading up to which involves Moses. At the point where the Hebrews now freed from Egyptian slavery, as we've read about in our Exodus text readings, are about to enter the promised land, the land that was promised to their forefathers, like Abraham of Ur and Isaac and Jacob. These are their descendants, most of them some of the Egyptians who came with them. But now they're here, and only a a couple, a few, related to the ones whom Jehovah chooses, Caleb and Joshua, are allowed to enter the Promised Land, not even Moses. But Moses starts out, before this point in the account, reminding the Hebrews of everything that's happened, reminding them, of what I just referred to in their captivity in in Egypt and how Jahuah freed them and delivered them and how he's been with them this whole time through the wilderness where they have been rebellious at times but where they've also been victorious by doing what he says, by relying on him. And really, remember, in our condition as humans since the time of Adam and Eve's fall or sin, doing what they want to, to our own ruin. None of us really have the right to live, do we? I mean, where does that right come from? If the biblical story is correct, and the God who made us didn't make us to do all the things that are incorrect, then really none of us should be allowed to do the incorrect things that we've been been allowed to do all this time. But because we live in a period of judgment, where Jahuwah is testing humankind and allowing us to be born in this sinful, imperfect condition from Adam and Eve so that we can have an opportunity through our heart or through our belief to have life in Jesus where we've lost it in Adam. That's our belief as Christians. That's the period of time in which we exist. And so Moses is reminding the Israelites that they're lucky to be alive, right? I mean, they're not only lucky, and I don't mean lucky in the sense like the God of luck, right? I mean lucky. They're very fortunate. That's what we mean by lucky in our common speech today. They're very fortunate to have been chosen this way, not just because of the freedom from Egypt, but as Moses goes on to say when he's talking about all the things that Jehovah has done to them along the way, he says, that Jahuwah gave you victories, right? And he's, he's freed you through all these things, even though everybody before him is deserving of death. But you, of all the peoples of the nations, he's chosen to do these things. He didn't appear 
at the base of a mountain in fire where no image could be discerned, but only a voice heard to any other people but the Hebrews, the people that he freed from Egypt. And not even Moses gets to enter the promised land, but they do, right? So they're special. And Moses is telling them this. He's telling them this and he tells them as well in in Deuteronomy chapter 3, leading up to the reading we're going to do, that he went to Jahuah, probably to the angel of Jahuah, who's been leading them through to this point, right? Like we read about in Exodus, who's there representing Jahuah as Jahuah's angel. That Moses went to him and asked to be allowed to enter the promised land, even after he was told he couldn't. And Moses tells the Hebrews that Jahuah told him, don't ask me that again, right? <laughs> it's very interesting, I find, the details and the way that Moses tells them, because why? He wants them to know how important it is and that they recognize that Jahuah is giving them the land, the good land that they spied out on and saw was a good land. A land that Moses wants to enter into. So bad that he went to Jahuah and asked him probably a few times, right? Because Jahuah said, don't ask me again, right? Because Jahuah is not going to you know, punish him for asking, but he's not going to let him in either because he's already determined who goes in and who does not, right? It's like in John chapter 12, where in quoting Isaiah, Jesus says he makes their hearts hard and unresponsive so that they won't turn around and, and believe. Or just like with Pharaoh, as we did in our text readings, because he doesn't want them to believe. He doesn't want to give them life, right? Because if you turn around and start believing, Jahuah is so merciful and loving, he'll start giving you, he'll forgive you, like we see many times. But there's a certain line that if you cross, he doesn't want you to, to make his heart soft. Like we saw even Moses did at times. So he will let some... Right? He'll let Moses ask him to go into the promised land, but at some point just tell him, no, don't ask me again, right? And so he's still going to stand by what he said, but you know it's okay for Moses to be Moses and want to go. We understand that. Jehovah understands that. He's not going to let him go. It's more severe, of course, with the case involving John 12 and those Jews who oppose Jesus, right? Not all Jews, but those Jews, because they were more wicked. They knew, even according to their own words, what they were doing and Jehovah's law. And yet they still did the things that, that were wrong. And so Jah didn't want them to turn around. He didn't like them. Jehovah doesn't like you. He'll prevent you from responding. And if he likes you or if he doesn't dislike you, right? He doesn't have the view of you like he does with Pharaoh or those Jews who oppose his son. He'll allow you to do things in ways that will make him more or less responsive to you. Right? You draw close to him, he draw close to you. So, in this way, we can see why Moses would relate that, that detail of his conversation with Jahwa, or his angel that was basically him in that way, according to what Jahwa told him he would be. Right, His name is within him. And so this would be the one who's telling him, don't ask me again. Right, whether Jahuah or him directly or, or through that angel, the point is, you know, you can see how things can be very personally experienced with people like Moses and Jahuah, and where he's still favored and chosen, but not allowed to do certain things. Right? None of us are allowed to do everything in those ways because we're chosen at a certain time to do certain things, and we either do or do not do them. In the case of Moses, he did enough of them to be at the point where he is now telling the Hebrews that Joshua and Caleb are going to go before them and they need to remember. Right? They need to remember the law of Jehovah that they received in connection with all these things as promised to their, fa- their forefathers and that as they have experienced since Egypt and that they, the ones to whom he's now speaking, will get to experience in the fullest sense of actually entering the land that even Moses wants to enter, but cannot. So he's trying to really build up this sense of thankfulness to Jah. 
so they don't forget it. It even says that, right? Don't forget it. Tell your sons. Let Remind them. And that's why we have these texts and such an impact from these events today. So, Moses then gives them the law going into the promised land. They go over the entire law, or at least the first ten initially in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And the text we're going to read is the third of those ten, first ten laws, right? The first being that you are not to have any other gods against Jahuwah's face. And as we've often discussed, and as Jesus himself states, right? We don't put the sons of God who follow their father and do what he says against him. How could they be against him? They're worshiping him so perfectly and completely. They are him, right? They're not themselves. They don't think they're better and that they should be themselves apart from the one they know is better, greater, as Jesus said, John 14, 28, right? Which we know, of course, he was speaking in reference to more than just a man. That's obvious, right? We'll talk about it when we get to that text in our Bible and the Trinity and Conflict series. But what I'm pointing out now is that when it comes to Jahuwah and the exclusivity we give him in our worship and recognition as the one God, we only accept the Son and the other sons of God who do what he says as gods to the ex- extent that they what? Represent and give glory to the one God. That's it. That's exactly what Jesus does and says, and that's exactly what they do in accounts like these where they're involved in speaking for Jah and doing what he says. Not their own will or what they want, which is what the rebellious sons of God do. They're against his face. And then it goes on to say, in the second place, you're to have no other God, not to make a carved image, right? Of anything on heaven, on earth, in the ocean, nothing. We should keep that in mind. There's something there that that can be, you know, uh, deceptive if we're not careful. Then he gets to our text reading today. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11. Hebrew translation, You are not to use the name of Jahuwah God for vanity or for something worthless, empty, is what it means in the Hebrew and Greek. We'll talk about it more in a moment. Because Jahuwah will not release from punishment the one who uses his name for vanity. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11, Greek translation. You are not to use the name of Lord Jehovah your God over vanity or a worthless endeavor. For Lord Jehovah may not cleanse or make acceptable the one who uses his name over vanity. Now, I use vanity here because that's mostly to me what the words mean, but It really, in the sense of vanity, means something empty. Like in Proverbs, it reads that we're, you know, that vanity is like chasing, it might be in Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, but it's where it says that um, vanity is like chasing the wind, right? Or holding oil in your hand. You can't do it. Not really. And so vanity is really an empty, it's, it's something that, it's like a mirage, right? It's not real. It's not really there but it can affect you mentally. And so we might overvalue ourselves or something like a conversation or event in ways where we think we're more important than what we should be considering. So in this case, what does it say? The name of Jahuwah should not be used in place of vanity, right? So vanity is when you believe, when you want to look better than you are, right? You want you want the attention to go to you. And if you use Jahuwah's name in a way where you want the attention to go to you and you're not just correcting someone who has a mistaken point of view or incorrect information and you're like, wait a minute, I want to make sure you understand something because I have information that would show, you know, this, this, and that. And so whether it's about Yahweh or any form of the divine name, Right? We need to be careful. Right? We can still discuss the right pronunciation. 
But we don't have to do so in a way that's blasphemous, right? You read in some texts where, especially when it comes to the name Jehovah, because it's an anglicized form, I've read, you know, uh, people who are against the Watchtower or who are just against that form of the name refer to it as a monstrosity, right? A hybrid form. That's not really appropriate for any form of the divine name. Not even Yahweh, really. Because you need to be more careful. You can point out it's a mistake or incorrect form in whatever way it may be. But to over-negativize uh, or to... to um, Overemphasize anything negative relative to a, an accepted form of the divine name would, I think, be walking too fine a line when you, you don't want to fall on the wrong side of because it states very here very clearly, does it not? If you do that in a way that draws attention to yourself and that's what you want, right? If it just happens to take place because you're defending Jah's name and people recognize you're telling the truth about what it means or how to say it, that's just what it is, right? That's not you trying to become more in someone's eyes at Jahuwah's expense, right? So like seeking out an argument with someone over the divine name, not to correct them or show them the right things, right? So let's say you've done that, but now you want to do it again, right? It's like something you really take pleasure in being over this person in a way that you don't need to be because you already have. Or you could do it in a way that makes the same point without drawing the attention to you. You don't want to have from Jahuwah because you're using his name. You can't use the divine name in a way that won't be evaluated at some point. So you have people like I would say, right? What the Watchtower would call apostates. Even though they might refer to me in that way in some sense. The fact is we all know, you know, I don't like attack them in a very negative way and I don't make fun of them right but some do and I think they they <laughs> come dangery, dangerously close if not um, going over the line when it comes to using the divine name right they might refer to Jehovah's Witnesses or Jehovah in a way that is negative and hey you know that if that's what they want to do I'm telling you though I don't think that's a good idea. And I think if you want to be critical of groups like the Watchtower, you can do it without blaspheming the divine name. So if you do so, you chose to do it, and Jahuwa, in our view, will hold you accountable. So follow the path of wisdom, even if you don't believe in Jahuwa. Consider the possibility you could be wrong, and try not to misuse his name. If you do, then may Jahuwah judge you in Jesus' name. So what we want to try to do is not seek out people that in ways will put us in a position where we will then f say something or express something that will come out the, the wrong way, right? In a way that is blasphemous towards Jah. So... We need to be careful how far we go when it comes to arguing with people who are openly blaspheming the divine name, whether it's Jehovah or Jahuwah or Jah. That's why we use Jah, right? To try to avoid the kind of arguments and debates that, while we don't mind having discussions and we've done debates and we've written and, and had videos about the name, but to get into heated debates about something as holy as God's name well, it says right here that Jahuwah will not leave those who do so free from punishment. So my advice is to always have a good reason and use Jahuwah's name right. right. Don't allow yourself to get involved with people that is going to make you not use Jah's name right. But we use the form Jah to try to keep from getting too involved in discussions over the the four or three letter forms, right? Jahuwa or Jaho, even though we think potentially Jaho is uh, the most reliable form or pronunciation of the of the full form of Jah's name. Either way, it still involves a lot of discussion and could involve some debate. And while that may be appropriate for a time, again, if you cross that line 
and you start to use Jacques's name in vain, well, then only you can decide, right? Only you will be in those positions and circumstances where inside you know whether or not you've crossed that line, where now you're arguing in a way that isn't giving glory to Jah. Right? You're no longer helping this person, you're just doing it for your own sake. It happens often with things like the Trinity, right? I would say. So while we have the divine name being, you know, set aside here as holy in a way where we're not to talk about in an empty sense, a, a, without a good reason. Often with the Trinity, while we may have a good reason to try to help people initially, we'll get into these extended discussions with the same people for many years even and end up with a person who is often hostile. I've had many, not every, and I know that people on both sides get hostile, but that's my whole point, right? At some point, if we just keep arguing, we're not going to use the divine name right. We're not going to talk about the nature of God right, even if we're talking about it right, right? Because we'll be arguing over something that's divine, holy, that we don't really even fully understand. <laughs> we're not metaphysical beings. So we get into these extended discussions of metaphysicality. Right? I try to just stay with the text. and We can talk about some things. But, you know, it can get off into a point where I believe, like we'll talk about with the creeds, they're way beyond what the text says and requiring things metaphysically that it doesn't say and contradicts. So that leads to these arguments then, right? Where we're called heretics because we don't accept something that's metaphysical, not in the Bible, and contradicts what it does say. So it can get kind of, it can get very difficult. Right, And so we have to be careful. We can't avoid all of those discussions, but we can limit the extent to which we allow ourselves to become involved if it's going to compromise texts like these, where we end up going beyond what we need to do for reasons other than praising Jah. So that's really the main thrust of the text we have today. And the one of two texts we're going to read, the next one will be in Deuteronomy 21 where we talk about the real firstborn, that's going to be great. You don't want to miss it because while the divine name, of course, is important, if not one of the most, and potentially the most important subject, right? Firstborn's a critical subject too, and it's one that also comes up. And it falls into the same type of category, right? Metaphysical stuff. At least when it comes to the discussion that can often get debated, as we'll see in our next text reading, it's not really debated when it comes to what the meaning of firstborn is. It's just a question of whether or not people are going to follow what the text says and how it's applied to people like Jesus. Or what comes about later, right? Or provide an explanation that is not consistent with what the text says. Either way, we'll talk about that next time. But I hope that you were able to gather from this text reading of Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11, that while... We're here to promote the divine name that we use as Jah, but also recognize as Jahuwah and Jaho in their anglicized English forms today, but that we accept in other language forms as well, as the closest approximation for the best available evidence that has come down to us. And so, it's very important that we use the right forms of the divine name as best as we can, right? The the best possible pronunciations, according to the best evidence, but that we do so in a way that doesn't create disrespect, let alone blasphemy, or make people think negatively of anything having to do with the name of the God of the Bible, because that's not what we're about. And while at times we do get in involved with discussions that we might wish didn't take place to the extent that they do. We can learn from everything, become better at everything, and do the best that we can to make sure that when it comes to the divine name, we always use it only when we have a good reason.